Welcome to the Lean Out Your Business podcast, a show dedicated to helping entrepreneurs accelerate business growth and simplify success. I'm your host, Krista Grasso, and I've been working with businesses for more than two decades to help them lean out and optimize what's working while eliminating anything that's not adding value. So if you are ready to get more time back in your day, more profit in your business, and to do business differently, growing and scaling on your terms, let's dive into today's episode. Today, I am super excited to introduce you to Miss Annie P. Ruggles. For almost a decade, Annie P. has harnessed her Hulk-like disdain for hard sales, tacky self-promotion, and overly competitive sleazeballs as inspiration to help people find better ways to grow their small business. As the founder and dean of the Non-Sleazy Sales Academy, she's guided hundreds of people towards making deeper connections, lasting impressions, and friendlier, more lucrative transactions and conversations. Annie P., I am so happy to have you on the show today. How are you? I'm thrilled to be here. That's how I am. (laughs) <laughs> I cannot wait to dive in today. We are going to talk all about how people can sell their services in ways that do not feel sleazy and do not feel untrue to their ethics. And I think that is so incredibly important. My first question is, what are some of the most common mistakes that people make when it comes to selling? Because I'm sure you probably see all of the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the one of the most beautiful horrible, painful, nauseating, fabulous choices I ever made was that I was going to offer a service where I listen to people's sales calls and review their sales pages. So yes, I have seen all the horrors, right? So I think if I had to distill it down to three major errors, the first error I see is they just don't ever sell. They just never get there, right? They they write this like, giant great wall of china of beautiful copy that just leads to absolutely nowhere and doesn't go and like you know you get them on a discovery call and they are so excited to have a lead that they just babble the whole time and never actually sell and so that's number one avoiding the sale right now that's normally caused by what i call no shock, sales avoidance. That's the first thing that I see. The second thing that I see is selling, but in a tone that is accidentally apologetic, right? Now you see this a lot when, especially on sales calls, in the form of awkward babbling, right? Awkward, anxious babbling. So let's say I'm selling you a product that's $2,000 and I we are vibing the whole freaking time. We're having the best time. You're loving it. You're totally on board. It comes to the big bad wolf of sales, aka naming the price. And I say, hey, and the price for that is $2,000. What most people will do that is wrong is they will freak out about the fact that they themselves just said that price point because it makes them in any way uncomfortable. And so what they do is they go, well, the price is $2,000, you know, and I know that that may seem high. That maybe says, maybe that seems high. Maybe it seems low. You know, some of my competitors charge way more and, and, you know, and that's okay. Like if they want to do that, that's totally fine. But mine is $2,000 and it used to be 16. You know what? For you, like, I know that you're a referral and you came in really nice and like, you're a really good person, Krista. And I really, really like you. So I'm going to give you my friends and family discount, even though we just met. So I just said 2000, but like, what about like 1000? Like I feel can't... like I've been on these sales calls. Yes! <laughs> yes! And we it's talk painful. ourselves out of it. It's so freaking painful. Or on the same version, you get a yes and like you don't even hear it. Like one of the most famous things that... Uh, famously bad examples of selling that ever happened to me granted i'm annoying to sell to because i pick it apart but in a very loving way i'm not in this to be a jerk i can't be in charge of the non sleazy sales academy and be a jerk that just doesn't work right (laughs) but i had a service provider that i had graduated from who i was happy with the brand of have a sales member of their team not cold call me because i'm a returning client but lukewarm call me and say, hey, as a graduate, I wanted to make sure you're aware of this new offering that so-and-so has come up with. And I, positive brand experiences only, got the value I paid for the previous time only, was like, yes, 
That sounds awesome. I have a need. Now, let me ask you some questions just to make sure that this is right for me. The second I asked any objectionable question at all, the second I showed not even hesitation, but curiosity about some of these things, I had previously said, you know what, that sounds really good. I just want to double check some things. They totally changed and started assuming that I was going to say no. And I kept saying yes. And they kept hearing no to the point where I said, let me go get my wallet. Let me go get my credit card. Sounds good. Sign me up. And she said, you know what? I don't want to rush you into a sale today. Why don't I uh, check up with you maybe Tuesday? I had my credit card in my hand. <laughs> I had my credit card in my hand. And to make things worse, that girl basically hung up on me. And do you think she called me back on Tuesday, Krista? So no follow-up after no! losing the sale on the spot that she could have had. <laughs> on the spot. And here's the thing. Like, your listeners have known me for five minutes. I think they can already tell. I am not a discreet person. So when I said, I was like, ooh, sounds good. That's exactly how I said it. I was like, hold on, let me go downstairs. And then she got to hear my chunky little butt trot down the stairs. <laughs> open my purse and she's just still not getting it right so that's the thing is the accidental apology or assuming a no that's the second one and the third one is not having any sales training not knowing where to find sales training and assuming that the only thing you can do is cobble together the sleazy practices of your competitors into some mix where you kind of modify them but sort of don't and hope that they work. So the first one is avoiding the sale altogether. The second one is assuming the no. And the third one is selling with sleaze because you haven't found out how to do it differently. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's when you say it like that, it sounds so obvious and you think, People have got to have more common sense than to do this. No. But I've been on the receiving end of this. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure everybody listening has as well. And some of us may have done some of these things. <laughs> I have done these things. Listen, I say all of these things out of love, compassion, and empathy because I have been there. The first person I noticed sales aversion or sales avoidance in was myself right was myself and as such like i had to stamp that out because what i was doing was offering value all day long and never letting anyone get near to it right so what i i talk about this all the time as a big beautiful chocolate cake where if you have your grandma's family recipe for chocolate cake and you decide that it is your dream, your passion, your life's purpose to uh, make and distribute this cake to the people, then you're going to start marketing the cake on social media, talking about it. You're going to go to three different grocery stores in a pandemic to get the right ingredients. You're going to special order the plate. You're going to get the right camera. You're going to get a ring light for that cake. You're going to do all this stuff. You're going to run Facebook ads and do your SEO and tell everybody to come experience this cake. And then when they get there, there's going to be pictures of the cake everywhere and the scent of the cake flooding into the room. And it's all just overwhelming. And then the cake finally comes out and it's half an hour late and it's in a glass box that's locked. <laughs> so you can see it and you can smell it, but you can't taste it. That is sales avoidance to a T. You're saying, I have all this value for you, but not for you. Yeah, that is incredibly frustrating as the buyer who wants to actually yes. purchase the product or yes. the service. <laughs> yes, you're like, where is the buy button, please? Oh. All right, so help us to avoid sales avoidance. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> What tell us all of your ways here because I love I really love what you do right I've shared with my listeners that I'm declaring 2021 the year of inspired growth mm -hmm. right and I think we should do things that we're inspired to do and I think the reason why so many people push against sales is because they feel like it is sleazy to your point and they're you know they don't feel very inspired to go out and sell so how can somebody who is a little avoidant to sales actually feel inspired to sell and do it in a way that feels authentic to them I love that question because first off, 
I want people to know that when I'm talking about sales avoidance, I'm not making fun of you because it's not your fault. In that we are conditioned by pop culture, by bad sales that have been thrust upon us to have a negative connotation to the idea of selling. Everybody has that to some degree. But if your business is your baby, if your business is your dream, if this is what you think that you are, you know, doing as your capital P purpose, you're understandably going to be very protective of your reputation and how you come across in the world. And sales has this negative, you know, stigma against it. So you're going, well, I don't want any of that up involved with my baby. I get that. I totally do. But the first thing you have to do is you have to redefine what selling is and what selling isn't. Okay? Getting someone to buy something, no matter what they need, because it's what you happen to be selling, is sleazy selling, not normal selling. Listening and prescribing and collecting currency in exchange for what you have prescribed, whether it's a vase, a coat, or a year of coaching, that is non-sleazy selling because you're basing it on their actual need, right? So if we can reframe selling as, let me build up all of the evidence that I am a great solution for you, and then just saying, and in exchange, I'm asking for this, the best way for me to encourage others into inspired growth is inspire yourself to include yourself in the equation, right? Because sales aversion is not a victimless crime. It keeps you from your clients and it keeps you from having a profitable, sustainable business because you're constantly mired in the muck of shout, 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 and pray, 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 pray. That is not a good use of your time. So, Inspired growth to me means I'm going to find a win-win here. I'm going to find the right clients at the right time. I'm going to wait my turn until that time is really right. And then I'm going to make sure that I present my case well, whether that's on a call or on a website or on Etsy or wherever. And then I'm going to command a price for that offering. That's it. There's nothing intrinsically bad with that as long as we're not selling, you know, a Tesla convertible coupe to a welfare mother of four because your boss will think it's great. That's disgusting. And that happens all the time, which is why we all have a negative idea of sales. But if you're just saying, hey, you're coming to me with a problem. I'm going to solve that problem. I'm going to give you my currencies of effort, time, energy, expertise, love, joy, artistry, whatever you're providing. Then all they're giving you back in return is money. And you, actually, then they got the sweeter end of the deal. You're giving all that and you're just getting some money. I really like the way that you frame that because I think the right clients is the key there, right? When you are trying to be all things to all people, you end up trying to over convince because you aren't speaking to that one person where you really understand their problems yes. and how your solution is solving their problems, which makes it a no brainer. And you're excited to be helping that person. Yes. You're excited for them to not just give you the investment in working with you, but for the actual result that they're going to get based on that investment. And Otherwise, that's what yeah. people into business in the first place is that wanting to offer that result to people. Mm -hmm. Right. Offer that result to people and be appropriately compensated for it. <laughs> Crazy concept. <laughs> right? <laughs> so one of the other things I want to dig in to with you is types of selling. So mm -hmm. quite often we hear you have to agitate the pain. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of bring out people's fears. Mm -hmm. You have to, what I call, kind of take people to a place of negativity to make them realize that they need the solution that you have to sell. I personally am a sell from a place of possibility kind of person. Mm -hmm. 
I like to paint the bright, shiny future. I like to have people see what they want. And I'm like, why do I have to bring people down and make them feel terrible in order to sell something? And I think there's probably a balance there. Mm-hmm. So how, how do you usually describe that and help people with that in selling? I think you hit the nail so on the head, which is that the number one reason why sales aversion has a tendency to rear its ugly head is because we don't like talking about pain. And that's really understandable. We don't like being vulnerable and talking about our own pain. We don't like trying to make people feel crappy and do their own, like into their stuff or like, whoa, I'm really violating this person's boundaries or this or that, right? Understandable. But the thing is, agitating the pain and breaking someone down are not the same thing. They are often taught as one and the same, especially around money objections. One of the most common money objection uh, answers that I see being used all the time on people is they'll compliment you and they'll say, well, you know, Krista, that's a nice top. How often do you go shopping? Maybe you think you could just like not shop for a while and then you could afford me? Like that is basically saying, hey, idiot, you mismanage your money and you're vain and you're stupid and you should hire me and stop being stupid. Now, a lot of people that are using that tactic have not gone far enough because they were taught it to go, ew, this is making someone feel bad. But really, insulting someone to prove a point is never, 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 never required. Never, never, never. But addressing the pain is required. So that's why they're not the same thing. So I love the way that you said that you come at it from a point of possibility. Where I come at it is I need my client to know that I understand their pain. And if I can't understand their pain, if I can't sympathize with it because it's not my world, I need them to understand that I see them. That's it. I either see them, I understand the pain, or both. That is what I have. That's the box I have to check right? It's not, let me bear my soul and tell you every single thing that's going on. Or it's not, let's re-trigger you, remind you of everything going on in your life. And so the way that I get around this, I love it so much. It is the best and most effective thing for dealing with the pain point is recast the play. If you are tearing someone else down. You have cast yourself as the hero and you have cast your buyer as the idiot villain of their own story, right? So they're like a self-loathing villain, even worse. No! The problem is the villain. The emotions tangled up in the problem are the villain. The pain points that get swirled around after the initial pain point, those are the villain. Now, you are not the hero. The client is the hero, bravely facing the pain. But you can't tell a princess got rescued story without the part about the dragon and the thorns. You can't. Got rescued from what? right? So if you're looking at it that way, then they are the hero bravely facing the pain. You are, insert role here, the cheerleader, the big sister, the mentor, the sage, right? You can go to a book of archetypes and find whatever role you want. You could be a wizard. You could be an elf. You could be Jiminy Cricket. It doesn't matter. But the thing is, you are there as a service to the hero or heroine. You are not there to be the hero. If we build them up in the face of pain and address the pain fully so they know that we understand how big the dragon on their back is, they're not going to feel beat down. They're going to feel supported when we say, we've helped people slay dragons before. We will do the same with you and for you. It's all about how you cast the play. 
Okay. I have to say that may be the single best description I have ever heard on selling and how to position something. And I think that's really great. And that I completely and entirely resonate with. Happy that death. makes so much sense because you're sharing the pain. You're getting them to see where they want to go through it, but you're not trying to make them feel bad. No. And that's what I don't like about when people say agitate the pain and there's just so much emphasis on it's like you're trying to make somebody feel so incredibly crappy about themselves yes. that they eventually go ahead and invest and buy. And I just think that is shady selling. To me, that is sleazy selling, right? I love the way that you positioned it. It's that makes completely so much sense. the same thing as when the pickup artist was like a really big thing and it would send guys into bars to be like, you're cute for a fat girl, Annie. And you'd be like, what? Did you really just say that? Because I can't tell if that was a compliment or an insult. And I'm very unsettled. And I don't know how to handle that. So I guess I'll just sleep with you because I don't know what my emotions are. Like that logic is the exact same thing as what do you need to talk to your husband for? You're the business owner. Aren't you independent? Don't you have separate checking? Why wouldn't you have separate checking? What are you, stupid? Same thing. Yeah. I was in a program that I stepped away from. I mentioned in one of my prior episodes with my year of inspired growth, I stepped away from a lot of groups and programs that I was in because A, there was a sea of sameness, but B, there were just some shady sales tactics and I didn't like it. And there was one person that gave, I mean, like she would talk all the time about doing exactly what you just said. When somebody brings up the husband objection, here's what you do. And I message someone 37 times and I just keep messaging them and keep messaging them and keep messaging them. And I'm like, I would block you so quickly. Who are the idiots that said yes to you on the 37th time? Um, but everyone's like, oh, I want to be more like this person. And I was like, no. I have nothing to do with this person. I am out. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm out. I mean, number one, 37 times, like seven times is spam. Uh, yeah. 37 times is like rotten spam that's been left in the sun for two weeks. Like, ew, do not. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. No, yeah. ew, 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 ew. And, and what I do for the husband objection, major spoiler uh, for all of my trainings forever because people find this terrifying. I find it hilarious. If someone gives me the I need to talk to my blank, I am also a I need to talk to my blank. Now, I'm a one-person business in terms of one-person C-level. I have a team of part-timers. They're not helping me make these decisions. I need someone, whether it's a mentor, an advisor, my husband, you. I need someone to vet these ideas before I take big leaps. I just do. But what most people are taught is like, stand on your own two feet, girl. Come on, make a decision. Or they go, well, I understand that you want to think about it. But if you book in the next five seconds, it's cheap. And then if you don't book in the next five seconds, it's going to triple in price. Like, ew. Freaking gross. But when I get the objection, again, I told you, go boldly opposite direction, right? Take a stance in the opposite direction. So if someone says to me, I need to talk to my husband, I go, cool, what's his name? Oh, his name's George. Okay, well, what's important to George? Well, George just wants me to be happy. Okay, but what does happy actually mean? Like, what are the metrics of happiness in you to George? Well, he wants my business to be profitable. Okay, there we go. We need to convince George together, you and I, if you want to go through with this, that this is going to help you become happy and therefore profitable. Do you want me to talk to him or do you want to talk to him and I can help you w figure out what to say? If you can make that conversation easier instead of blasting the conversation, it's amazing. And so what I normally just do is I'm like, what's your husband's name? George? Hey, is he around? They'll go get their husbands. And you know what's really hysterical is sometimes when I do talk to the husband, immediately they're like, what the hell am I talking to you for? I told her this morning to just sign up. Like, what? Why? <laughs> why? What? Huh? Or if it's a selling up situation, I need to talk to my boss. I need to talk to my board. I need to talk to my whoever. Then I make sure that they have a solid argument for what they want when they go in to talk to the possible opposition. And then they come back and they go, yeah, they said yes with flying colors because I made a good case. That is way more fun, 
easier, more personable, sets me up for lifetime of value of a client instead of just a one-time nasty transaction. And yet, 99% of people are still taught, girl, stand on your own two feet. You don't need to talk to your husband. Let's talk about the non-sleazy sales academy. So how do you actually help people with sales and where can people find you and find more about you? So my crown jewel, my most beloved program is called Sales for Empaths, and it's a complete selling system specifically for coaches, healers, and service providers. But before you even consider hiring me for anything, if you're liking this concept and you want to dig in more, if you're bumping up against sales aversion, sales avoidance, or you just aren't sure what strategy you should implement, you should start with my free training, which is called Making Selling Easy Without Getting Sleazy. And that is available 24 7 3 365 on my website, which is AnniePRuggles.com slash Easy Not Sleazy. That's the best place not only to hear about how I can get you across the finish line of sales in a way that feels really beautiful and genuine both to you and to your buyer. We'll get there. But for right now, let's get you out of sales avoidance. I absolutely love it. And I love your whole approach and everything that you do. And you are always keeping things super fun. And speaking of fun, this episode is going to come out before my interview on your show. Oh. But everybody, guys, you guys have to listen. Oh. A, Annie will be back on this show again because we are going to dive in and talk about the really creative strategies that she leverages for her podcast, which I'm obsessed with. And I think you will all <laughs> enjoy as well. But B, on the interview with her, we talked about Brett Michaels, <laughs> as well as leaning out your business. And I have to say, it was not only the most fun podcast interview that I've ever been on, I don't think I will ever be able to top it as far as a combination of something that was both fun, but super value packed for business owners. I'm so, and so glad. You got to stay tuned. Yeah, I will let you guys know when that episode comes out. <laughs> and Annie will be back. Um, but Annie it was before, a blast. It was amazing. Um, before we take it away here, I want to ask you our final question, um, which is, how do you work smarter, not harder in your business and lean out? I make sure that I'm not over marketing and underselling because over marketing is expensive. It's shiny. It's fun. It's time consuming and it will kill your business. And it has almost killed mine more than once. So what I have to keep doing to work smarter, not harder, is I have to make sure that I am boldly, bravely, compassionately, ethically asking for the sale pretty darn often. I don't want to, like, again, I said four to one is my ratio. That works for me. But find the ratio that works for you. Make sure that number is at least, you know, pretty close because otherwise you're just going to wind up over marketing exhausting yourself and i've already done that spoiler it's not fun i did it for years don't do it work smart i absolutely love that so guys no over marketing no underselling find your ratio and go find annie p ruggles <laughs> because she is yes yes <laughs> How do you work smarter instead of harder? Hire me, baby. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. And with that, we are going to round things out. And I will see you all again next week. Annie, thank you so much for being on the show. It's always a pleasure to be anywhere near you. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. I hope you got a lot of value and actionable insights from today's show and would love if you take a moment to leave us a review. If you have any questions on today's episode or on how to lean out your business, join us over in our private Facebook community where every week we do live training and Q&A and I'd love to have you be part of the conversation. Head to leanoutmethod.com slash group to join us. And before you go, be sure to subscribe to the show so you're the first to know when we release a new episode. We'll see you next week.